Let me uh, introduce to the stage Senator Natasha von Inhoff, the co-chair of the Senate Finance Committee, Representative Ivy Sponholz, the co-chair of the House Committee on Health and Social Services, and Renee Berner, uh, the executive director of the uh, Alaska Native Health Board. Good Lord, that's a lot of words. Let's give them a round of applause. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here and for taking my emails at the last minute. Brene was like on a flight. She's like, yeah, I could do this, it'd be great. And Senator, you were traveling somewhere abroad. And yeah, what, what's this look like? And I was talking to your staff, and so it all came together. So thank you guys. Um, Senator, let me, let me start with you. Um, I always like to provide windows into leadership so people can learn regardless of their silo uh, in sort of a peer way. So I think questions of leadership are are always interesting, and I also like to elevate the human nature of public service and how hard it is sometimes as individuals to be in the grind of public service. So what was it like being co-chair of Senate Finance during a session that uh, went on a long time, had a lot of, uh, uh, boy, a lot of different opinions about data and what different opinions about, um, uh, you know, programs, and you were really a, uh, a pillar in the legislature in terms of trying to drive towards fact and, and get answers. What was that like for you as an individual in a really difficult political time? Well, I have a couch in my office and after the end of every Senate finance meeting, I would go into my couch and lay down and I would stare at the ceiling and practice breathing. <laughs> and, uh, and there was a mantra as in calm, clear and concise. And so it was, um, some words uh, resonated more than others depending on the circumstances. But it was always trying to remain calm even if you're upset or if you're overwhelmed and then remain clear headed. And sometimes it took almost 30 minutes or more to um, process what we learned um, from the presentation. Uh, occasionally I would actually walk during the day, but I always walked in the evening. And actually that's one thing that actually saved me was I got a big headlamp and I bought Cretula uh, um, crampons and I would walk in and around Perseverance Trail or um, up, um, Mount Roberts or on the Treadwell Trail, and I would um, sometimes talk to myself as, okay, what did I learn today? All right, these are the, these are the clear points. These are, the, these are um, the good talking points. This is the path, then the, the path forward, the next steps. This is the follow-up I have to do. So, and then it would, um, we just tried to maintain a healthy lifestyle just with the walking and the laying on the couch every once in a while, and that's, that's how I got through it. And then I have the best staff in the building, one of them right there is Julie Lucky. They are a calm, um, here's your smoothie, here's a washcloth for your forehead, you're, you're good. <laughs> uh, so walking, uh, smoothie, and washcloth. Uh, Representative, how about you? Uh, you on uh, the House Health and Social Services Committee, but also as a, a vocal member uh, on other issues, fiscal issues, uh, issues related to confirmation, you really distinguished yourself as a strong voice in the legislature uh, this year, but uh, in recent years as well. How have you found the, the challenge of leadership in a difficult political time? Um, I think that there is uh, something about challenge which focuses uh, me. It focuses my attention. Um, I'm the kind of person who likes to have too many things to do um, and um, gets, you know, gets bored pretty easily. And so in a lot of respects, you know, I'm well suited to the legislature because the, the, the challenge and the many balls that are constantly sort of being thrown your way um, tend to really focus me. I, I think that for me, it's very important um, to try to figure out how to get up above the fray of uh, the individual points that are sort of, that are coming up um, as we're having floor debate, as we're considering policy items, and try to see 
the landscape and figure out what the direction is that we need to go, not where we are, but where we really need to go. Um, I think, you know, is it Wayne Gretzky said something about not know, not one, you know, the best players really know where the puck is going, not where it is right now. And the challenge in the legislature, and I think that with political leadership in a time of a lot of contention, but I think it translates in any kind of leadership, is really trying to figure out how to get above the fray and see the landscape and figure out where you need to go as an organization, as an individual, as a state. Um, and I try to do that. I think, like Natasha, I value... Um, the outdoors is a way to do that. I do my best thinking um, when I'm walking um, and uh, you know running and um, and moving. There's a lot of research that says that when you're using both sides of your body, you're actually able to process really difficult things. Um, there's a whole body of psychological um, treatment that is about responding to trauma that. Um, called EMDR that was based originally on the, the original researcher realizing that he did his best thinking and problem solving when he went on walks. And then they went and tested out the theory and found out that in fact it actually helps you to process really challenging things and they use it for helping people to process trauma. My, one of my, my adopted uh, foster daughter used it to, practice, to process her trauma, but the same thing can be done for you know, processing sticky problems that you have. Going for a walk is the best way to solve a problem, I think. Yeah, so Renee, same type of question, uh, but through a cultural lens, where you're, of course, you, you engage in the political sphere as an advocate, um, but also you, you represent a, a, a set of cultures that um, sometimes takes a longer view than one legislative session. Uh, how do you manage the, the sort of stress as an individual um, stress of leadership during a time of political challenges? I certainly do appreciate the question. Um, for me, uh, my start goes back to um, growing up. I grew up with uh, what was called the Inupay Ilukosait, uh, and that is a set of cultural values that have been identified by the elders in my region. Um, it, it encompasses uh, aspects like um, uh, responsibility to tribe, hunter success, love of children, um, humility, humor, and just a number of values that just come together. They're not unique uh, to my tribe. And in fact, they're often shared across the board um, with many indigenous peoples, not just in Alaska, not just in the United States, but across the world. And um, being able to sort of go back and think about the responsibility to tribe, it takes you out of yourself. and you look at the bigger picture and how you'll fit in it again, not just today, but for your children, your grandchildren's children. And um, I am incredibly proud of what the Alaska tribes have done in creating the um, Alaska Tribal Health System. Um, I was just in a, a presentation where I shared that Alaska has 229 tribes. And um, those 229 federally recognized tribes have come together in a way that is not matched anywhere else in the United States. Um, they had determined um, long ago that they would negotiate a single compact with the federal government. And from that, they have such a, a space of unity uh, and strength that uh, coming together, we've been able to identify the issues in, in, a, in a way that is together um, and uh, takes, takes the many voices and helps channel them into the one. And so uh, being able to go back to those cultural values, but uh, looking at ways to get the input from uh, the members of your community and channel that into your messaging. And there's a real strength that, that comes forward when you know you've got 229 tribes behind you. Yeah. So Senator, you know, I think a lot of folks would like to take a long view in a perfect world, true in and out of the legislature. Uh, but as Senate Finance Co-Chair, when, uh, you know, when this budget is for, you know, the very near term and you're talking about cutting dental uh, services or uh, services for children or other really grueling tough choices, um, how do you try to keep sight in healthcare and health policy and Medicaid how do you try to keep sight and balance the long-term trade-offs with the more immediate uh, demands for balancing a budget? Well, 
a couple comments on that. Uh, there's been some conversation about doing a biannual budget, and there is currently a lawsuit with the governor about education funding, but it's more than that. It's more of whether the um, legislature could pass within a two-year time frame during the election cycle that would ac actually pass a two-year budget for all departments, not just education, but others. That's, you know, two years, is that long-term, is that short-term? I mean, it's not very long in the whole scheme of things, but it's more than just one year. So that's something that I've been advocating for for quite some time, and hopefully we're taking steps towards that right now. Uh, a Senate term is a four-year term. So when you get in, um, particularly as a freshman senator in 2016 that I was, um, there was drinking from the fire hose. There was a lot to learn. I had served uh, three years on the school board, so I was a little bit familiar with some of the statewide issues because I'd studied healthcare. Being the largest cost driver for the Anchor School District, I had flown to Juneau a couple times and talked to folks there. So I and I wrote an article about it with the Alaska Business Monthly Magazine in December 2014 on the high cost of healthcare. But so the issue is, is that there's a lot, there's a great deal to learn when you're in uh, government. Hopefully, you have more than one. Um, term. If you're lucky enough to want to run again and get elected again, you could have maybe eight years down in the Senate. Uh, and that's a good solid chunk of time that you can actually have some continuum. I think it's important to meet with uh, the commissioner, the deputy commissioner. Uh, we've had under the Walker administration different people. Now we have the Dunleavy administration. I'm running again next fall. If I'm fortunate enough to be elected again, we'll continue with the, with the Dunleavy administration. So there's some continuum. Um, it is constant push-pull between short and long-term. It is important to attend forums and symposiums like this. It's important to get out and work during the interim. It's important to learn as much as you can. Um, setting a staff member down to Oregon to kind of uh, look at the MODA model. Um, I'm on the Blueprint Transformation Project and Transformation Committee. That's been a two-year process. That is immersed. Uh, my knowledge in that in that um, field as well. So healthcare is a passion of mine. It's one thing that I do try to sp uh, spend a lot of time on. So, Representative, how do you I mean, you've distinguished yourself, as I said, in terms of health policy it, in a short matter of time? It's not an easy subject matter for legislators to get, particularly when they've got you know a bunch of other things and a day job and family and all those other things. How do you find talking to other legislators about health policy? Is there the mental space to have a really solid evidence-based policy conversation? Or is there not enough space where ideology and party politics sort of dominate? Yes. Um, I, I think um, that uh, you know, it, it behooves us as legislators to really spend the time to learn as much as we possibly can so we're making informed decisions. And one of the things that I really love about the legislature is that there are 60, you know, creative, smart, hardworking, ambitious people that are voracious learners and readers. And I've never worked with so many people that were so curious about so many different things. And so the time horizon is very compressed in that we have to get our job done in 120 days, ideally. Um, I, I'll say I've only been in the legislature for three and a half years and I've already done nine special sessions. So. Um, you know, I think it, it's a reflection of the unique fiscal time that we are in our state, but it is also a reflection of the fact that we have failed as a state to truly come up with a sustainable long-term fiscal plan, which um, serves us well in both times of high and low oil prices, which, you know, I think, you know, we've all grown up here in Alaska, the three of us, and so um, we've all been through this cycle. And, and, uh, and that's really challenging. But when it comes to a topic as complicated as healthcare, um, there's not very, many, not very many things that we do that are more complicated. Maybe oil taxes, that's pretty tricky stuff, um, but that are more complicated. And I think trying to find a way to, um, to you know, have those substantive conversations with people when you can, and when you can't, to try to distill it down what, you, what you've learned in the years that you've worked on a topic so that people understand that we have the second highest healthcare cost in the nation behind only Washington, D.C., that we pay 38% um, more for healthcare in the state of Alaska than other you know, communities do across the country, that we're not getting better health outcomes, and that there are ways that we can restructure that we're delivering healthcare so that we can um, actually improve our health outcomes while also reducing costs and improving everybody's experience of healthcare system. 
Um, and I think that's the challenge of leadership in the, in the legislative process is that you have to figure out how to communicate very difficult topics with people that don't necessarily agree with you, who don't necessarily come with the same lived experience um, that, uh, that you do and try to get to the heart of an issue as quickly as you possibly can to as substantive a resolution as you possibly can. And that means having both a short time horizon and a longer time horizon because we're not gonna solve healthcare in any 120 day session. Everybody in this room understands that reforming healthcare is like a marathon. Um, it's gonna be you know, the work of our entire lifetimes to reform healthcare. And then there'll be the next generation of reforming healthcare that the next generation will take on. So you have to have both of those time horizons, I think. Yeah. Brene, how do you infuse your lived experience into the conversation about healthcare advocacy. And let me uh, add the postscript of, you know, most people who lead healthcare organizations uh, are often white men. Most people who get elected in the state of Alaska to a position uh, in the legislature or governor are often white men. Um, and most people who are cared for in the Medicaid system are not white men. Um, so how do we bridge that gap between a demographic of decision makers and a demographic of folks who are covered uh, beneficiaries? And how do you bring your lived experience to that conversation? Well, in my position, I think where it goes back to is really the leadership that comes from the tribes. Um, and I think the wisdom that they had um, brought forward in creating that single compact is just one example of it. But um, you know, going back to something that uh, Commissioner Crum said at lunch today, um, that Alaska has many unique aspects to it. And um, one of those things that he referenced specifically was the Alaska Tribal Health System. And so that is born from that single compact. But with that, we have been able to create a healthcare system that spans 660,000 square miles over, um, and we have over 180 uh, community um, primary care centers, 25 sub-regional um, uh, care centers and, and um, with mid-level providers, four uh, multi-physician hospitals and six regional hospitals. And uh, many of you here are familiar with the Alaska Native Medical Center. This is a true system of care. It's one of the largest um, in the state, but it's also one of the largest in the nation. And again, none of the tribes in the lower 48 have been able to accomplish this example. And I think you can see the successes that have come from that um, and, and the ways that they have done it. In fact, the VA, um, a, a few years back, uh, some of you may remember the, the VA Choice Program. It was actually modeled after that system of care where um, the Veterans Administration entered into tribal sharing agreements with the tribes, um, expanding their six points of access of care to the over 200. So their, their footprint went across the entire state with that. And that, again, it comes from um, coming together and designing it. it it's, a, it's a true referral um, system of care where you go from a village community to a region to the statewide levels. And then we have a number of partners outside of the tribal health system as well. So, so I'm sorry to interrupt, go ahead. Yeah, um, so, but, but it really goes back again, it's not just any sort of one individual, but it, it's coming together and creating that unity and you can help develop that sort of shared vision that can go across and um, whether that is uh, 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 culturally based or not, um, it's it's definitely shown to be effective, and and you can you can see the the impact of that um, yeah. overall. So, um, Representative Sponholz, I'm I want to ask you the same question about your lived experience and how how you infuse that into uh, your work as a legislator. But I'm also interested in, in your thoughts on the cultural piece. Uh, there are a number of cultural interactions within the legislature. Sometimes they're geographic, southeast versus interior, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what kind of cultural sophistication does it take in the legislature? Those are really two questions, your lived experience and then sort of cultural literacy. Sure. Um, well, I think that every legislator has their own unique set of experience, and I'm a little bit unusual um, from a lot of my colleagues in, in the legislature and that I was born out in a dry log cabin in the Wrangell Mountains. Um, I grew up in Anchorage. Um, 
like a lot of people, when my parents uh, separated, my mom had two young children and moved to Anchorage. And um, my family experienced pretty significant financial hardship uh, during the first big oil um, price drop um, after we moved to, a, to an oil only, essentially, economy, at least in terms of state funding. And we went from living kind of this middle class lifestyle on the hillside to uh, you know, living in you know, a cockroach infested apartment in Mountain View. And um, that experience, I think, helps me to understand that people aren't poor by choice. Um, and just because you're poor doesn't mean you're inherently a bad person. It means something bad happened to you. Um, and I was fortunate that my mom worked really hard she went back to college when I was a teenager, and we moved back into the middle class um, because of you know, the opportunities that we had and the opportunities she made for herself. Um, but I think that gives me a very unique set of experience. And then through my career um, as a nonprofit executive, you know, I worked for a lot of organizations that serve people that were less, for less fortunate. So I worked for Abused Women's Aid in Crisis, my first job back in Alaska when I moved back about 20 years ago. And my most recent job before I was appointed to the legislature was working for the Salvation Army, where we delivered you know, homelessness um, programming that's actually funded by the state through 19 Salvation Army locations throughout the state of Alaska, as well as a lot of addiction treatment. And so I, I learned a lot about that, and that um, helped me to understand the role that state plays in a lot of those programs. People think that because the Salvation Army is delivering that program, that it's actually <clears throat> private donations that are funding it. The pri private donations augment it, but it is actually state funding, which pays for the homeless assistance programs that the Salvation Offer Army offers across the state. So that was pretty important. Um, in terms of the cultural differences, um, that's one of the most, the most fun things about the legislature is you get to meet people from all across the state who have such different experiences, from Tiffany Zolkowski, who's from the YK region, to John Lincoln, who's up you know, from the Northwest Arctic Borough and lives in Kotzebue. His, their experiences are very different than mine to the folks that live out in the Matsu Valley, where one of my brothers lives. You know, we all have very different experiences. We have different sets of values, and it's exciting to get to meet a lot of different people who have such different values. Sometimes it's challenging because, um, you know, maybe they don't come from the same, you know, set. They don't have my personal lived experience about living in poverty as a teenager, and so they may not have the same perspective on what it's like to be a poor person and what it means to be a poor person. Mm -hmm. But that's my opportunity as a leader to educate them about what that means and what, what you know, the opportunities are for us um, in offering Medicaid and offering homelessness assistance programs throughout the state. Um, and I, I think that's one of the fun parts. Senator, while folks are cogitating on that, uh, your sort of lived experience of being you know, in the finance sector and, and other things, I think distinguishes you from folks that might you know, be more active in tourism or fishing or other natural resource-based uh, positions and who are also in the legislature. Uh, does your professional or your personal lived experience have more of an impact on how you approach issues uh, as a legislator? So my background is finance, and I have a master's in business. Um, so my life is spreadsheets and data. Uh, that's my comfort zone. Um, I, am, I appreciate the conversation with culture because it's very real and it's very impactful. But I've also learned that we all... While we do need to come together, we also have to honor our talents and that we share, we come, we do a round table. My talents is data. And, and so for that, um, I have been gravitating towards the um, Alaska Healthcare Transformation um, Project, towards the, the data portion of what could actually help move Alaska into a more, um, let's see, 21st century that 18 other states are doing right now with this all-payer claims database. And there are um, states around the country that have been doing this for well over a decade, and they're seeing good results in that they're able to um, take data from multiple different sources of claims and then being able to make sense of it and look at trends and look at population health. So that's where... That's where my talents are. That's my background. 
Um, that's what I can lend to the conversation. And in fact, I have my file here and I'm, I can ready and talk a little bit more uh, about details. Um, and I'm actually looking at legislation potentially this fall, um, hopefully working with um, Representative Sponholtz to look at creating a, um, Colorado did this in 2008. They started the process and says, here's what we want. We want to be able to put uh, data from across the state um, into an all players claim. Here's the governance, here's the structure, here's, here's what kind of data here and so forth. It took them two years. Um, they were able to actually implement something in, in 2010. So I'm under no illusion that this is gonna be done, you know, however many special sessions this coming year. But <laughs> we need to start at one point and take the bite of the elephant. And that's what I am working towards right now is coming with some legislation this, this uh, session. Um, to move us towards an all payer claim database um, function of some type that we all have buy-in, that we all talk about, and we all try to come up with some type of agreement that makes sense, that protects privacy, that protects um, business secrets, you name it, um, but that can at least make it useful for uh, payers and patients um, and providers in the state. So if Governor Dunleavy had called you uh, Senator, and maybe he did, and he said, you know, I'm making changes with my chief of staff, I'm making changes with my uh, budget director. I would really like to have a better budget process in 2020. What advice would you give me? How would you answer him? Well, so first of all, the governor absolutely has my cell phone, and so I would love a phone call from the governor. <laughs> I'm not holding my breath, but that's either here or there. Um, what would I say? Well, uh, he has an opportunity to drop his budget around December 15th. And I do not know at this time what's going to be in it. Um, I did meet with him in regards to education. We did, um, because education was held harmless last year, so I'm worried and curious about what's going to happen this year. A big chunk of education is health care costs of educators and employers. I brought that up in Senate Finance this year. We, I did have a conversation with the governor about a month ago about that, and uh, there was bat batting around ideas. There was nothing definitive at that point. Um, I, I, you know, I don't want to talk necessarily in hypotheticals in terms of what would the governor say or what would I say, other than I've always advocated for a balanced spending approach across all 17 departments and the 18th department which is the permanent fund. I think that we need to look at our horizon in terms of the next five years of oil prices, production, and market returns. We need to take a look at our union contracts, our retirement, our debt payments, um, some of these non-sexy items that actually have a chance to creep up on us, as well as earthquake costs and wildfires. We need to put all of these things in on the page and see how we can make the puzzles fit together. And that's basically what I would tell the governor. Make sure, make sure you're not shy. Oh, Fred, you know what? When I look, when I think of somebody, that's okay, come on up. When I think of somebody who's shy, your name is not on the list. Uh, Fred, let me let you uh, ask a question here. I just wanted to follow up on the earlier comment about the creation of all payer claims database. As the Senator knows, this is one of the priorities that was established by the transformation project going forward. And uh, the observation was made that we do want to be able to protect uh, privacy, albeit whether it's the individual claimant or business secrets, and I'm wondering if you could speak a bit more as to how that would be structured, and I say that given the fact that our organization is also very active with the Washington Health Alliance, which has been pushing for years toward the creation of an all-payer claims database in Washington State. It was created, but there were certain providers that pushed back, and it never got quite to where they wanted to go but they did take baby steps forward in biting that elephant. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your comments, Fred. You want to take a crack at that? Yes. So there is a manual on my desk back at the LIO right now that talks about one chapter. It's called the technical build. And it talks specifically, well, there's only about 15 or 20 pages in the chapter about the technical build. It goes into some detail about ways to protect consumer data as well as provider data, but it basically stated you need to have a committee and to have the people 
talk to, I think there's two, potentially three, and Sandra might be able to answer this, that have been doing this, when I say doing this, third party vendors around the country that have figured out, they've worked with the 18 states that actually have an all payer claims database. The one book did say that all states do it differently. There's 18 different ways on how they report data, which data they're reporting, what their data they're collecting, et cetera. So for me to actually say, well, we're gonna block out the person's age and only put four letters of their social security, I can't say, I don't know. I mean, I think that we need to have people such as yourself and Fred, we've had this conversation, be at the table or be left out. And so I think it's important that if this is a part that's really important to you, then sign up and advocate for what you believe is right because this train, if I have anything to do with it, it's gonna go forward. Representative, you wanna jump in? Yeah, I wanted to sort of, um, sort of dovetail. And first of all, I also wanna give a shout out to Sandra Heffern, who's been leading the Alaska Healthcare Transformation Project for the last couple of years. Senator Von Himoff and I um, are on the Project Management Committee for the Transformation Project. And I think uh, that it's an incredibly important project. What we know is that we're only going to really address cost and spend and quality in the state of Alaska if we all come together cross sector. You can't have any one player dominating. It can't happen in government. It can't happen without government. You know, everybody needs to be a part of that process. And so we've been working really hard on that for about two years now. Um, and you know, one of the key things that we've identified that we need to do is we need to measure what we're spending. And we have a lot of information about what we're spending, but we don't have everything. And we need that information to be available in a transparent way for policy analysts, for researchers, for you know, legislators, for other folks in the community to be able to gather all of our collective knowledge and wisdom to be able to do the work, but um, in order to understand where the opportunities are. Where are we spending too much money? Where are we not spending enough money? Um, we know that we're spending, you know, I think Commissioner Crum called it sick care earlier instead of health care, and I absolutely agree. I've been sort of saying that for about three and a half years now as well. We need to be driving spending in different direction than where we're investing it right now because we need to be investing in the health of our communities rather than paying for sickness and, re and responding. But that process, whatever it looks like, it's going to be set up as it'll be a collaboration. No one person is going to set, is going to define all of that and impose it on everybody. The beauty of the healthcare transformation project, and one of the reasons that I'm somewhat optimistic about what we may be able to achieve through it, is that um, you know it is a collaboration. We have you know we have a senator, we have a representative, we have representatives. Commissioner Crum has joined the project management committee. We have representatives of hospitals and direct services providers, insurers all across the sector in healthcare, folks are involved in this. And I would encourage you that if you're interested in being a part of defining what an all-payer claims database looks like, get involved with the Healthcare Transformation Project. You have been, and a lot of people in this room have been, but I wanna make sure everybody knows that this is an open opportunity. This is, you know, if you show up and participate, you will get to be a part of shaping you know, what these strategies look like. And there's five strategies that we've, you know, identified through a series of community meetings over the last few years that are, you know, that are advancing in order to try to achieve the healthcare quadruple aim. Because we know that we need to get everybody aligned so that we can make the really big change that we want to see in Alaska so that we can improve healthcare and reduce our spend at the same time. I just wanted to add real ahead, quick uh, with regards to that. I know that uh, with um, the Healthcare Transformation Project, uh, the uh, um, Alaska Tribal Health System has mm -hmm. been a part of those discussions as well. And we have developed, uh, our, and we have a number of uh, subject matter experts that are part of that that can address some of the issues like um, data governance and, and, um, and ownership and um, how to look at the different um, sources of data and incorporating that. And I, just as we move to the next step, the next step of implementation of these, um, that that collaborative process uh, just uh, continue on in, in the development of those, the structure that will ultimately be uh, what they're looking at. So Renee, let me ask each of you this last question, we'll have you start. What advice would you give to people as they lead their organizations or lead their programs or advocate perhaps you know, we're in this sort of crazy political time. We have this impeachment thing going on. We have, you know, recall. It's, it's a little unsettling. 
as organizations are trying to lead through this period of uncertainty, what, what should their North Star be? What should their guiding principle be? Or what advice would you give? Um, the, the main advice that I would give is going back to uh, something that Senator Murkowski had said earlier, that process matters, that um, it's too important not to get right. And we've seen a lot lately uh, where uh, we're trying to just go through and make certain cuts or, or uh, make certain changes in response to the environment around us. But moving too quickly can um, be truly detrimental. The Medicare program was established in 1965, and it's incredibly complex. And uh, we can do a lot of harm to ourselves uh, by not getting, uh, taking the time to get the input and the stakeholder um, involvement in helping to inform the process as we go. So we understand that there, there are certain needs that we have to address the short-term challenges that we're facing, um, but we can do a lot more damage to ourselves if we don't do it in a way that it really gets input uh, from um, the travel health system, from the, the payers, the insurer, uh, the, the, the providers, and, and such. So I, I, you know, taking a step back, breathe, and um, apply that to that process as well, and so yeah. that it's truly mm -hmm. informed. Um, I did want to say um, a, a quick thank you to um, Senator Wilson, where he had stated that healthcare is not a partisan issue, and I just I second that. Mm -hmm. Representative Sponholz, what counsel or advice would you give to folks as they lead their organizations in this time of transition? I think that it's always important that we be looking up and identifying what the North Star is, you know, and um, getting above the clouds a little bit. You know, I like to spend a lot of time in the two gatches and I like to get up high and see what, you know, what South Central, what this beautiful community and place that we live in looks like and think about what's really important. And when I think about healthcare in particular, it really is about, you know, making sure that Alaskans are as absolutely healthy as they can, but being as efficient as we can. And, you know, I'm gonna just, you know, reference the healthcare trip, you know, quadruple aim, making sure that everybody's having a really good experience, that um, the data matters. I have a master's degree in public administration and I really care about making sure that we're measuring data, but we also wanna make sure that it feels joyful along the way. Um, that we, we take a little time to make sure that people are having a good experience because if they're having a good experience while we're you know, working through the really tough problems, they'll keep showing up to work through the tough problems. Yeah, good. Senator, last word in terms of guidance and advice for these folks? Well, there are a lot of people in this room today and I do wanna say thank you. It's towards the end of the day and thank you for being here. But the fact is, is you're here, I believe, because you care. And because you care, it means that you're willing, I hope, to get involved. And there, uh, there's going to be, hopefully, a lot of changes going on uh, with healthcare, with the Blueprint Trans uh, Transformation Committee. And there's many um, opportunities with the governance, with the data, with looking at social determinants. I think there's about four or five different things that we're looking at. And there's subcommittees in all of them. Um, this is gonna go on for the next couple years. Hopefully, if we can pass some type of legislation, and it's nothing, the legislation, I don't think it's going to be, um, it's gonna be an action item as in an, a call to action, as in anybody and everybody in this room who cares about healthcare can help work towards a vision to um, the triple aim was basically to decrease the growth of health care, mm -hmm. have everybody um, have access to a primary care provider of some sort, um, and I think just overall population health and, and more of a continuum of care, um, something like that. So I guess the North Star is to create healthy, happy, and productive communities. And... Um, and with my little hat, it's more of bending the cost curve because I have to put that plug in because that's I'm the, the data gal. But everybody in this room, you're here because you care. And Ivy and I sit there and get beat up in Fernay because we care. And we're gonna run again and because we care. And we care just like you. So let's let's all work together and um, and make Alaska a healthy, happy, and productive place. 
Senator Natasha Von Inhoff, the co-chair of the Senate Finance Committee, Renee Berner, the executive director of the Alaska Native Health Board, and represented by the Sponholz co-chair of the House Health and Social Services Committee. Let's give them a round of applause.